Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Melanie Metzger, and I'm chair of the Department of Interpretation. We at the Department of Interpretation are thrilled to have you here in attendance. We know that some of you have come from far and near to join us today. This is the section second lecture of our lecture series. We'll have a total of six different lectures on various topics throughout the year. Um, so look forward to those upcoming lectures. We have three sponsors to thank for the lecture series, the Department of Interpretation, the Interpretation, Translation, and Research, ITRC, and then finally the Gallaudet University Regional Interpreter Education Center, G-U-R-I-E-C. This annual series is comprised of a selection of six lectures. We wanted to bring together interpreters, interpreter researchers, interpreter educators to spark dialogue in terms of research that's out there, the current findings that support our work as service providers and also support the continuation of research around interpreting. We have uh, presenters coming from all over the United States, um, internationally as well, with some invited from Europe. Sometimes our faculty, our Gallaudet faculty will present, and we will also have some student presentations as students. Right now we're undertaking some research projects of their own, and uh, we'll likely see those in the future. Most importantly, we do hope that these lectures provide some thought-provoking um, ideas and further discussions. These lectures are free and open to the community, to anyone who is interested. We will provide CEUs for those members of RID. We also have that opportunity, um, because this is being recorded, that those who weren't able to attend in person can later watch this lecture on video. You can find it on our website at a later date. As part of our mission, our many goals in cultivating research in our field, I also wanted to take a moment to announce and advertise that this spring of 2014, we'll be offering our very first International Composium for Sign Language Interpreting and Translational Research. That will occur March 28th through 30th of 2014. Please hold that date in your calendar so that you can attend. More information about that will be forthcoming, so please keep an eye out for emails and advertisements. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the director of the GURIEC, Beverly Halra. Beverly? Good morning. We're thrilled to have our lecturer here with us today. The GUREIC, or GURIC, is part of a national consortium of interpreter educating education centers. And there are six centers across the United States. Our mission, and the reason why we've established this center, is to take advantage of money that we've gotten through grants to encourage and build and expand upon research practices for interpreters to be able to improve the skills of the interpreters that are out there working as practitioners and also to uh, enhance our services to the deaf community. GURIEC is in 14 different states. And because of our consortium with the NIEIC, our work really happens throughout America. Because of our video streaming capability, we are even more fortunate to have um, the opportunity to not only have a national but an international audience. 
we have um, individuals from uh, Holland, Australia, Finland, Cassie from Ohio, for example. So I, I know that there's many people watching through our live video stream, and technology has just afforded us that opportunity. It's an amazing, um, it's just amazing to be able to provide this lecture series um, at a very low cost. You know, one good thing about what we're trying to do here is um, make sure that interpreters never stop that process of learning. I would like to turn the floor over now to Brenda Nicodemus. Thank you, Bev. Appreciate your welcoming comments. And now it is my honor to introduce Lori Wynott. Before I have her take the floor, I want to talk to you a little bit about today's um, structure. Lori will present for about 40 to 45 minutes her research on international sign, IS. And then we have Dirac Dr. Gaurav Mather, who is in attendance. Dr. Mather will come up at the conclusion of Lori's presentation and talk to her about some of her findings. He has some questions for Lori. And then we will have an open opportunity for those who are in attendance to ask um, Lori some questions. And then we'll end by 1 o'clock. I have known Lori for several years, both as an interpreter. She has 22 years of interpreting experience, mostly in the Boston area, but I met her in San Diego, California. She was interested in doing more intensive research, working around the globe, um, studying international sign and its uses. She has been a mentor and um, provided workshops, and that's led to further contemplation about international sign, how it's used within the deaf community. So she decided to move to Australia to study her PhD at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity today to listen to what she has undertaken in terms of her research and findings. Lori? with International Sign Language. And the reason why I chose this as a subject for research is through my experience of interpreting for 22 years and traveling to different conferences, living in other countries, working as an interpreter, meeting um, various deaf people. 
I'm very interested in what happens when those from different languages come together and how they connect and how they connect their languages. And as interpreters, we feel the duty to provide clear and accurate information in our work. And so I started working with International Sign and I asked myself, well, how am I going to know that I'm clear, that what I am expressing is being comprehended by my audience? I also want to know how International Sign uh, impacts multicultural interactions. And so, I would say for the last 10, 20 years, maybe even more than the last 20 years, there's been an increasing um, contact of international signs. People are now traveling more often, more frequently. Lifestyle is um, enhanced now for deaf individuals. Conferences are more widespread where international individuals are coming together. Gallaudet has an international center and a lot of programs that are offered online, which um, provides a multitude of platforms for people to meet. And also uh, governmental or non-governmental organizations, social networks, social organizations are now providing opportunities for deaf people across the globe to meet and interact. And so these are um, some of the numbers that um, I have calculated in terms of events per three years since 1924 that include international deaf individuals. So uh, I looked at every three years and the increasing number of opportunities for deaf people to come into contact. And so international sign has become a more popular uh, topic or subject. People are very curious about international sign. People are very interested in becoming uh, fluent in international sign. So it's in and of itself becoming much more visible in the field. Thousands of deaf people and non-deaf people are using it who have interactions internationally. And also working interpreters uh, have been implementing international sign in public places since 1977. So, what do we mean by international sign? How can we define it? It seems to be a moving target. Uh, the dictionary has a lot of different definitions. But is that research comprehensive? What is it based on? And where do we see international sign being applied? In conferences, in one-on-one -on -one environments, or and in those one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions? Do you have people from different countries who are coming together and creating international sign? Or is it a pidgin type of uh, contact language? If you have a person from Germany or Japan, is their interaction then even different from um, those from other countries? How do you define international sign? And so that is what I'm looking at in my research. I'd like to clarify what I mean by international sign in uh, the purpose of this study. It's distinct from negotiated contact signs um, or contact languages if we have a specific context that we're talking about or if you have a presenter, a deaf presenter or a hearing presenter using international sign for um, providing information which is expository text which typically happens at global conferences and meetings. Often now you're seeing more video logs or vlogs that create
create awareness, uh, which is used on the internet, like H3 or Deaf Nation or YouTube. A lot of people are using international sign in order to disseminate information. So contact sign the contact of sign languages are not studied often. There are some researchers that show that uh, languages are often borrowed. Sometimes words are borrowed from English or um, mouth movements will follow that of the spoken language of such country. So there is contact between spoken language and sign languages and there is research to validate that. Now in terms of sign language contact, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, um, often people will adapt their own languages um, as they're moving in conversation, so it's very hard to research that. And research uh, is quite minimal on international sign language. There's a lot of discussion about the structure talking about the fact that it's iconic, but it's not a language. It's more of a complex pidgin contact way of communicating. It does not look like a full natural sign language. Maybe some of these structures are, are borrowed from specific national sign languages, like SLOs or, um, I'm sorry, SVOs. And um, there's phonemes and syntax and certain lexicon structures that are observed in full sign languages. So a lot of sign languages that have been researched show evidence of um, phonology, morphology. Some um, verb types can indica indicate subject and object. And there's also a lot of sign languages that use depicting or classifiers, constructions to communicate. Uh, they communicate um, figure, ground motion, location, orientation, or manner. So some of the problems be, um, that we're discovering is that there's limited study of international sign. There are a lot of questions that have yet to be answered. A lot of people want training, but the training doesn't have research-based curriculum from which to refer to or to teach from. Do we teach lexicon? Do we teach gesture? Do we teach um, depiction? Um, that is yet to be established. And it is being used also more often that inter interpreters need to use international sign languages to express messages. Or if there are expository presentations, interpreters and deaf people are tasked to use international sign languages. And interpreters and translators are um, certified to work between whole languages and not necessarily creating an international way of communicating. And my question is, uh, are people comprehending the international language that's being portrayed to them? So in terms of interpreting NIS, uh, my my research actually does not focus on interpreting, but I would like to incorporate some of the ideas of interpreting into my research. 
you know, if you're interpreting um, in the most natural way, which is between one spoken language and one sign language, that same strategy can be applied to interpreting into international sign, but um, there are challenges that arise when doing that, when trying to determine your audience. Uh, maybe you don't know your audience or all of the individuals, and you need to have varied strategies in order to convey a message. When I began my research, I recognized that I'm one out of many interpreters who have experienced um, working with international sign. And so I wanted to survey interpreter practitioners to get a sense of what other people are experiencing. So as a whole, I had 45 respondents who are interpreters who have experienced international sign in their work. 11 of them were deaf, 33 of them were hearing, 70% use an um, international sign one to six times a year. So out of 60%, uh, seventy percent of them were only using it one to six times a year, which is not often. Forty one percent train others in how to use international sign. And this may not be surprising, but I thought it was interesting to note that um, most people have their first language as ASL or BSL or uh, Auslan, New Zealand Sign Language. And so 75% of the responders ha have those four as their native languages. And a lot of them have ASL and then also one of the other um, Banzel sign languages. So they have a lot of contact with sign languages. And I asked them questions about international sign language and what is the most effective way of um, expressing themselves in American sign language and um, what types of comprehension are these people seeing. So what a lot of practitioners um, felt was that having fluency in at least one or two sign languages in more than written, more than one written language, and also fluency in fingerspelling, understanding of classifiers, use of three-dimensional space don't rely much on their native sign languages, especially the influence of ASL. Some people think that the most effective international um, sign language user is well-traveled and exposed to other cultures. And um, our native signers, as well as uh, having other intuitions. And I thought that these responses were very interesting and again, also informed me that there's not enough research on this. I also asked interpreters what they felt um, was being understood the most. The main points as opposed to detailed information when communicating an international sign. Most people felt that 76 to 90 percent of main points were understood. I'm sorry, s main points were understood 76 to 90 percent of the time. General topics were understood 90 percent of the time. And for some there was a range. Um, People thought that 
Fingerspelled information was understood 41 to 60 percent of the time, and uh, details were understood 61 to 75 percent of the time. So there was quite a range there in terms of what practitioners felt um, their audiences comprehended in terms of details through international sign. So what this tells us is that we still definitively don't know what's being comprehended. And in language and communication, we understand that there needs to be conventions and form that people can identify, that have identifiable patterns, meanings and pairs, conventions of, what so what are the conventions of international sign? And through my research, uh, I became very curious about um, what those conventions were. I haven't been able, I have not looked more into the lexicon um, frequency and types. I actually looked more at uh, depiction. Mm. Excuse me. Um, I did do some research on lexical frequency and types and was able to collect some quantitative data there in terms of how much people are using that in, Ameri in international sign. And then also, how often are people using depiction? How much compared to lexical items? and when and how. And in sign languages, they are fully lexical lexicalized, partially lexicalized, and non-lexicalized signs. So what types of signs comprise the lexicon of an international sign? And we notice these three different types in um, sign languages. The fully, the partially, and the non-lexicalized signs. So that's more of a gesture, maybe a non-manual marker, or some type of movement. And so research is looking at where those appear in sign languages, and then also where they appear in international sign languages. So far, uh, there have only been four lexical studies reported. And of all of them, it seems that approximately 62% to 73.2% are core lexicon. And then there are other kinds, which are depiction, pointing, gestures, and finger spelling. And the percentage of gestures ranged for BSL, ASL, uh, Auslan, and it ranged between 0.2% to 8.7%. And the 0.2% comes from ASL frequency studies. And I suspect that that's because the notations may be approached a little bit differently, but that's why there is that range in the natural sign languages. And so I did collect some um, data on a international sign language and looked at what the percentages were there. I wanted to compare how many lexical signs appeared and I have preliminary counts but I'm still um, working on my data right now.
So I'm looking at lexical signs that come from um, the original just Juno dictionaries or now more commonly used signs at WFD from myself as an ASL user um, who have who I, I've been signing for 26 years. Maybe there's signs that are shared in other languages. Um, but I'm still looking for those overlaps in sign types. And then last are signs that we see in Auslan and the benzyl signs. So that's what you see here. And th you see a high percentage of sign types in American Sign Language. The other percentages that we're looking at are 15% of depicting signs. That's higher, actually, than other national sign languages, and we expect that, as well as um, Then there's pointing signs, which we see at 10%. And then gesture and constructed action. Finger spelling, which is quite low, which makes sense, because a lot of people wouldn't understand one-handed finger spelling. And then the 2.5% it comes from unknown. So it's interesting the kinds of text that we're looking at is it expository or narrative, anecdotal, or conversation, one-on-one -on -one types of things that would actually impact the types of percentages that we're seeing here. And so I'm hoping to look at a few examples of Auslan expository presentation or more conversational work. I'm now working with uh, Trevor Johnston, who is an Auslan uh, uh, researcher and he has a corpus, and I want to compare where um, we're finding some of these sign types. And we want to make sure that the sources are of the same genre. We don't want to compare apples to oranges. What I'm really looking at in terms of my research is how much of international sign is actually understood and comprehended. What I'm finding out anecdotally um, from people's intuition is that they understand information being presented um, to them in their native sign language much better than what they can get out of an international sign language. Now, Rosenstock, who is a researcher here at Gallaudet, said there's about an average of 50 Four percent information is understood across groups. Rosenstock's dissertation showed a lot more in-depth structural analysis of international sign language. It talked about um, comprehension, and she had two different ways to measure comprehension, and I have used those um, two different methods in my research. I often wondered, how can we provide comprehension in international sign language? How can we increase international sign language? We know that there is a role of iconicity. So we mean signs that look like what they're referencing. However, sometimes um, iconicity is very culturally based. And from research, Rosenstock's research, we know that there are many signs that are very iconic. So there's also a role of uh, natural sign language elements and then the role of metaphor. Metaphors have been shown to be widely used in spoken languages and manual languages. We have Sarah Taub, who 
included a lot of work on iconic mapping versus metaphoric mapping in 2001 using American Sign Language to see if that type of process would lend itself to the use and comprehension of international sign language. I have some um, information about depicting signs in my data that I've collected as well. Rosenstock's research described a lot about the structure of the language. She used interpreters from either the UK or America. First, she used um, summaries of an interpretation and then talked to interpreters about their specific um, word choices. She also found a list of high frequency signs that were used, actually 162 different signs. From that list, I'm not sure which types are depicting and gestural and which are lexical, if they are lexical, which language were they borrowed from. So that's an area in which we need more information. Where is the lexicon in international sign and which native language is that lexicon um, being used from? My research project is a little different than Rosenstock's in that I'm using different types of sources of international sign. I'm looking to understand that when a deaf presenter has an audience that is very diverse in terms of the sign languages that they use, international sign language is determined to be the target language in an expository sense I want to compare, you know, and maybe we'll have 15 different presenters from um, several different countries, not just the UK and Northern America, but also from Africa, from Brazil, from some Asian countries, Northern European countries, Central European countries, so really f globally. And then also take a look at the participants the participants will later on be involved in a comprehension study and they will be selected from five different countries. I'll talk a little bit more about the participants role later on. I will be using five different measurements for comprehension. Those are my methods. And I will be doing a comparison from international sign language to their native sign languages. Right now I'm obs assessing how one comprehends information through international sign compared to their full or native sign language. My aims for this research project is I want to investigate what is the impact on comprehension, what are the various factors. I also want to find out if discourse information is provided through international sign language and determine the differences between what type of discourse information is conveyed between international and what would be conveyed through someone's natural sign language and determining which language has an impact on comprehension. If a participant were to watch uh, international sign language, would their specific demographic background have an impact on comprehension? You know, maybe one person grew up using uh, British sign language, would that have an impact on how they could comprehend international sign versus someone who grew up with British sign language but had, had it traveled extensively throughout the globe? Here's a list of some guiding questions. To what extent are international sign language messages understood? 
In general, what are the conventions of international sign language, the lexical inner or linguistic conventions, um, and frequency? Could you interpret a full text, full written text into international sign language? And what conventions would you use? I have two different data sets. I'm collecting information from deaf presenters who are not interpreting a text, but they are providing a presentation to a diverse audience using notes. It's not scripted. I'm documenting and annotating information based on what lexical items they're using and the frequency at which they're using them. From that information, I'm going to create maybe a four to six minute discourse based on that full presentation that was given initially, and then come up with a comprehension test to provide to participants to see how much they in fact comprehended. The first group of data was collected from a variety of different places, as I mentioned. Fifteen different presenters. There are some interpreted text, um, interpreted into international sign language, but I haven't yet incorporated in that, that into my analysis. I have 218 minutes of data. I'm not going to be able to look through all of that, so what I've done is reduce that to 105 minutes of annotations using an Elon, which is a software system to um, help me ac accomplish this. The annotation guidelines for Oslan Corpus has a very specific structure and approach, and I'm using that approach for my uh, research. I am finding what has been called ID gloss, which is a way to uniquely name each form that I've observed. So if I f see deaf used with two fingers instead of what we typically use as deaf one using one finger in American Sign Language, I will document that as that's Aslan Sign Language. If there is something being depicted, then I will use a specific acronym to show DH is the acronym that I will use to show that that's a depicting sign. There are several different types of depicting signs. I'm trying to annotate all of them. I'm measuring movement, um, location. I'm annotating for gestures, constructed action, constructed dialogue, pointing. I'm, I'm also, I need to finish annotating English m m movements on the mouth. As I've traveled to different countries and seen different participants, what I've noticed that they've said is that they've been able to read someone's lips and just through that action been able to tell that it is um, they are a user of American Sign Language. Now this next slide will so show um, just some examples. I've taken screenshots of my computer to show you this software, this Elon software. The next data set is from the comprehension test. I selected five video clips Out of the five, I use the last, well, each five are from different countries. The last two were actually interpreted texts. 
So what the participants will see are the first four videotapes in international sign language, and then a final video clip in their national sign language, the native sign language they've grown up on, grown up using. So for example, they will see several video clips in international sign language. They will see one from a sign language that's not native to them and one from a sign language that is native to them. And then I, I will, as the researcher, ask them different questions, different comprehension questions, to help them provide some And just to provide a little bit more information about the last two clips, one of them is more detail-oriented and one is very task-oriented. I wanted to provide the task-oriented video clip so I could actually um, measure the performance after I, after I asked the participants to perform a specific task. As I mentioned previously, participants are from five different countries. All of the participants were required to have a minimum of a high school diploma, and they were either born into a deaf family or they learned sign language um, during the critical period for language acquisition. I also collected demographic information from each participant background information I collected was which country they were from, what was their first signed language that they acquired, their first written language, their knowledge of international sign language, their knowledge of ASL, their knowledge of English, how many different languages they've known, how many uh, countries that they've visited, and if they felt like they have met a variety of deaf people from across the globe or not and that's the type of demographic information I collected. There were five different measurements that I employed. I watched the full discourse and then, or the participant would watch the full discourse, pardon the interpreter, and then I would ask them to rate the comprehension on a five to one scale. I also had a question and answer period. I had questions about the content that they had just viewed. Then I had some pragmatic questions or information that I was asking, like what type of audience did they think that was watching that presentation because these were all videotaped so they didn't see the audience. And then I showed different signs from the videotape. And I asked from a list that I had already annotated as high frequency signs that were used in this international uh, discourse or presentation. And then I would show these signs to the participants and ask what they thought that these signs meant. I scored um, their answers based on for accuracy based on a range of semantic meaning. And I also had clusters of signs from the videotape. So for example, if the concept of improving in a great deal was used by a string of signs that were put together, a cluster, I would ask the participant if they could understand what that cluster of signs meant and what it meant to them. There was one video that I asked the participants to watch because I had a specific task, a different task, that I wanted them to perform. I would allow them to watch a specific portion of the video, I would pause the video, and then I would check to see how they were um, comprehending the information, if it was accurate, if it was not. I would do this for both the international version of the text and also the version or the video clip that I showed them in their native sign language.
here are the results that I've gathered so far. I haven't incorporated information from America or Australia as of yet. What I wanted to capture is how people felt about seeing a video in their own sign language, their native language, or international sign language. And you can see here in green, this is how many people preferred watching this clip in their natural sign language versus the blue shows how many preferred watching it in international sign language. And, and, and how much was comprehended. And you, we can see a difference between um, the comprehension, that there was less comprehension when participants viewed this uh, text or video clip in international sign language as compared to their native sign language. I'm showing you um, in terms of high frequency lexical signs. Actually, I, I kind of already went into that a few slides ago, so I'm going to jump ahead. It was not just a lexical sign identification but I also wanted to really analyze the comprehension of finger spelling, numbers, both numbers in international sign language and numbers that were portrayed in their native sign language. Again, I'm gonna jump ahead a couple of slides. I had some content questions as I talked about before, some general information questions and some to elicit more specific details. There were about 58 propos propositions in the text. And I was able to score that information based on the rubric mm -hmm. from their retell. I mentioned before that depiction was used often throughout many different um, natural sign language, native sign languages to specific countries, and also in international sign language. But I wanted to look more closely at international sign language and its use of depiction and what those depiction sentences or items meant, what they were referring to. So I'm going to show you one or two examples, one or two clips. Not all depiction, but um, they do have um, some depicting items in there that I wanted to take a, mi a minute to show you on this video. For example, this clip was from a presentation. I showed this clip to pr uh, participants and I asked them, of course there are some um, you know, depicting items in here, and we everyone clearly knew that this person was talking about a box, but I asked what was in the box, what was coming out of the box, I really wanted to um, see what participants understood from that video. Here's another video clip I'd like to show you. So this presenter used a very specific sign that showed typically maybe one person had more power, one person was of uh, lesser status, and I really tried to ask the participants what information they got from that clip. We did talk about um, language policies 
and implications for use of international sign language? Is it appropriate at international conferences? Um, how will international sign language be used to communicate? And how will we know if that communication is effective? We see more and more conferences using international sign language plus the local sign language of that region and English as well. And that has implications for language policies, which should lead us to further discussion about this issue. At the same time, we know that out of the 2007 UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled Persons, that deaf people have the right for um, equal access. However, if you are attending an international conference, you can imagine the expense that could amount um, up to providing access for interpreters in everyone's native sign language. People from other countries who attend an international conference, some don't have access to interpreting services and that conference would be hard for them to understand. And they would be depending on the international sign language for the information being conveyed by the presenter. But is there true comprehension happening? Is international sign language effective in the specific venue? How can we make it uh, more effective for the audience? Definitely we need more research in this area. What works, what doesn't work, what type of international, or what type of venue or um, setting is most appropriate for the use of international sign language. All of these topics need further research and discussion. More and more individuals are asking how they can learn international sign language. And when we think about training, we have to first think about do we have enough research to build a curriculum to train international sign language? And if not, what more information or research needs to be done? International sign language has been shown to be effective in some areas, but I think that we need to clarify the boundaries before we can um, continue to make claims as that. And then finally, conclusions. we can conclude that we need more research, that's obvious. We need more varied samples, possibly regional variants of international sign language. There was one researcher who talked about um, variations within Asian countries. They have a dictionary published of international sign language that Asian countries use. And I went through those dictionaries and counted how many, oh, how many of those signs are ASL. And I found 50%. Now that may come out of just people meeting each other from two different countries, America and an Asian country, and using what we know as contact sign. Because often individuals know a second or third language, even though they're deaf, typically the second or third language would be either British Sign Language or American Sign Language. So I'm very fascinated in what happens with um, contact sign language when two individuals come together who don't share a common language. And then families. Could international sign language, could contact sign be used um, internally amongst family members? maybe who are both deaf and hearing. So that is my presentation for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Gaurav Mather. I know he has some prepared questions.
All right. Well, thank you, Lori, for a wonderful presentation. I know I enjoyed it very much, and I think this is a very important topic. International Sign Language hasn't been researched as much as I would have liked to have seen it researched in the past, and I'm glad that you're undertaking this project. Looking through your PowerPoint, I had a lot of questions that occurred to me, and unfortunately, our time is limited today. So I chose four questions that hopefully will spark further discussion even after today's presentation. You raised the question of how to distinguish international sign language versus natural signed languages. And I think that's a very important question to be asked. Are you looking at specific signs, like a sign-to-sign -sign correlation? I'm a linguistic by nature, and we often discuss the idea of marked versus unmarked signs, and I can give you an example of what that means. Hand shapes. An example of an unmarked hand shape is this, 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 and this. Now a marked handshape would look like this, 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 and here's one last example. Now the difference is marked signs are harder to produce and also harder to comprehend. So I'm wondering, within your research, what would be easier to recognize a marked or an unmarked sign in international sign language? I'm just wondering what your thoughts on are, are on that. It's an, it's an amazing question. And uh, in my research, I'd just like to clarify that I'm not looking at hand shapes per se, but from all of the data that I've looked at um, in my research, uh, uh, many things have caught my eye. Uh, I'm of course, I'm a student, and so I'm very curious, and I have looked at hand shapes. Um, but I have not necessarily reflected on um, the difference between marked and unmarked and the significance of its relationship with uh, comprehension in an international sign language as opposed to national sign language. But I think it would be worthwhile to check into. I know in the Rosenstock study, there's a high percentage of unmarked handshapes. And, uh, but it's not necessarily being looked at as relationship as it's related to comprehension, but rather structure. But I think that's a very interesting question. Unmarked and marked are not always about hand shapes, but it can also be location, movement, phonology. It can also be at the word level. So it's not, I just wanted to clarify that unmarked and marked signs are not just specifically talking about specific hand shapes. My next question. You again raised the question of would comprehension increase if the international signs that were being used were more closely related to that individual's na native sign language? You talked about the different regional variations in Asia, <coughs> South America, Africa, other areas across the globe. So if there's an individual from Japan who's grown up using Japanese sign language and they understand the Asian form of international sign language but then traveled to Europe would you be interested in measuring their comprehension if they were to try to understand international sign language as it came from a European presenter? I wouldn't necessarily be looking at that, but I have been able to see some patterns uh, in the international sign videos, like with the five videos that I used. Some of them were um, Japanese uh, signers, and so they participants may have understood them better than those sources who are from other countries. And I think that's also, yet again, another good question that I'd like to look into. Maybe I can do that. 
in the future. International Sign Language is a fascinating topic, fascinating topic, but it seems very unique to signed languages. I'm wondering if there's any parallels we can draw from a spoken language. As I mentioned before, I'm a linguistic. Um, that's my background. And I'm just wondering if you will compare in terms of modality and what differences you may see using a different modality of language. Would international sign language help us understand greatly or, or more in depth um, differences in modality of language? Well, I think because the international sign is an actual sign language system uh, and many of the different people that come into contact are actually borrowing from one another in their language use. So for example, um, what was that? There was a, an, a created spoken language. And pidgin is also something that um, people who use spoken languages have used as contact languages. So but for sign language, it'd be interesting to see how the visual gestural component of the language provides for more ability to understand one another when they borrow from other languages. I do think, though, that there are differences between um, contact spoken languages and contact sign languages. I would have to look at the types of research that are out there already for the spoken languages to see if I could compare that with sign languages. You mentioned one possible, um, well, you talked a lot about depiction in your presentation. And our language incorporates spatial um, features and non-manual features that have grammatical purposes. And I'm wondering if spoken language can take advantage of some of those features. Because we have to incorporate these features in a signed language for it to be comprehensible, for it to be accurate. And I'm wondering if spoken language could take advantage of some of these features. Because these features are not necessary to comprehend a spoken language. They're necessary to comprehend a sign language. But I'm wondering if some of these features could be um, a added benefit if spoken languages use them. Actually, that makes me think about, uh, you know, in depicting signs, international sign is a more is a, is a younger language, and so it has um, be evolved and has become more grammatical and conventional, and so there are still uses of depiction and different levels of um, grammar within the language. And I do think it's possible that depiction, depiction from different sign languages do have some similar patterns and could be shared and borrowed. Maybe when um, people are s using icons or referring to um, standardized types of things, it creates more comprehension. But again, culture has an influence there. So for one example, there's, um, you know, for myself as an American, I may talk about begging in this sense, while another person may take off a hat to represent begging. So in my data, I actually show different people from different countries, and it's amazing how um, some people didn't understand my sign for begging. They thought it was um, shooting because of the way that my hands were, mo were moving. It was, beg it was a begging. It was about begging, but they had never thought of or seen that type of sign. Maybe um, deaf people from their countries have a different way of begging, not necessarily um, have it depicted as a hand um, reaching out for money. I agree. It's vital to look at cultural influence on language and language use as well as um, the different categories of gesture.
um, that is actually a very good uh, example that you used. I know that um, representational gestures will do exactly what the word infers. It's, it's more representative of the action, whereas emblems are harder to understand. Okay, I have one final question for you. I'm thrilled that you raised the question about um, language policy and how your research could affect policy for international conventions when people uh, who are participating in that scenario don't share a common language. I went to an international conference in July, last London, in London. It's called the Tisler, T-I-S-L-E-R. And interestingly enough, they do not provide international sign language as they don't recommend it as uh, a language for um, to 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 be for participants to be able to access the content. And I'm thinking it might be due in part by the proficiency of the participants. There are some you know situations where you have people who are very proficient at understanding and accessing information through international sign language, and then you have the opposite end of the spectrum. So I'm wondering if we need to take into account participants' proficiency with international sign language and have that inform our decisions around language policy, because international conventions could take place in an academic setting, uh, athletics-related um, con uh, conference, so I'm just wondering your ideas on this. I've actually noticed that, too, at the Tisler conference this year. I thought that was very interesting, um, that preference to use a full language for access. And I think it's interesting that you noted that as well. But again, going back to the issue of the source type and the situation, where is the international sign being used? you see more and more deaf people interacting, you see more and more people using uh, international sign, and as they use it more frequently, they become more proficient. And I think that um, training is important, and how do you determine proficiency? And I think that goes back again to the need for more research. What is the most salient, uh, most effective way of teaching it and learning it and I think that we're um, you know on on our way but there's definitely a need for more research and it's hard because there's no test for proficiency in uh, international sign it was difficult for me to develop a comprehension exam because um, I needed to discover comprehension in many different ways actually even though um, it was only limited to that type of presentation or that genre, or if you have a situation where there's one or two people or a group of people and they share a context or they don't share a context, and what does that look like? Right, there's so little information out there on international sign language. Your research is a wonderful start um, that I hope will not be the last of, it ki uh, last of its kind, but I do hope to see more researchers follow in your footsteps. Uh, I think there's plenty of work to be done. Okay, I am done with my questions, so thank you again, Lori, for your presentation. Okay, so we do have time, uh, looks like about five minutes for some more questions. If you could come to the front of the room. Christopher? Hello. I have a comment and a question. Most of the audience members who know another sign language, I'm wondering if there is uh, a difference between an urban signed language and a sign language that would come out of a village. So typically, you know, um, ASL has its derivatives in French sign language and other sign languages come from languages just because people have moved around the globe 
and I'm just wondering if there are similarities between spoken language and sign language but if I know Roman romantic sign languages so for example French Italian I wonder if I'm more adept to learning romantic spoken languages I don't know we know that BSL is not in the same family as ASL so for example we don't know the sign for year in ASL where it comes from um, it could have been influenced by any one of those romantic signed languages of Argentinian, Italian, French. So when I, s that that's just a comment. I'm 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 seeing uh, more contact happening across the international deaf community, and that's having an impact on our language use. So my question: one theoretical framework I like to use is the relative theory or RT cognitive situations and our spatial resources and how we utilize those to really um, clearly get our point across to another person international sign language seems to sort of change those rules I have information and I am wanting you to understand the information, but I don't expect I have to do all the work. I don't expect to have to spoon, f spoon feed you. I expect that you're going to meet me halfway or at least negotiate our language use. I know that um, hearing individuals tend to think that there's a quick fix for people who don't share a signed language, and that's to use an interpreter. But I'm just wondering if that really is the best solution. How are we looking international sign language and as it's used in a community situation and that the hearing way of thinking about international sign language and how that's negotiated? Wow, your comments are um, very interesting and I think that that theory that you're talking about is very interesting. I couldn't necessarily speak to that. I do think and, and, and agree that deaf people use international language in a very different way and it's negotiated as opposed to decided um, in terms of using spoken language interpreters. Um, you know, in deaf communities all over the world, contact language is used daily and it would be important to create parameters first for how we're describing it and to understand it to know that we're not using it in different types of situations. I think it would be important to do that first, to first describe what we're doing. And you talked about um, historical uh, languages and linguistics, and I think it's important that international sign has changed a lot. You know, another thing on my list of, of things I'd like to do is to study um, how international sign um, has evolved over the last 20 or 30 years. Maybe it's something as simple as the lexicon and where it's coming from, from 30 years ago as opposed to 20 years ago, as opposed to today and in the future. So I think it's very interesting if we could look at the historical languages and how it's shaped international sign language. I think there are so many overlays, it's very hard to pinpoint. I think we have a lot of opportunities for research how deaf people are using international languages as well as hearing spoken languages are being used across languages. I can't give you a specific answer, but I think that you do raise uh, a lot of food for thought here. Let me just continue along with in that vein. Um, international sign language is often thought of as one thing. I know several languages. So when I'm interacting with one individual, I often think about what languages they know. If they know English, I might use um, some more ASL signs, and I might um, use English um, words, you know, and mouth them a little bit more prominently on my mouth. So it might not be history in the moment, um, you know, if... Oh, pardon the interpreter. I need to know about that person's history in the moment. Right, so if um, they are from 
uh, Europe and they know two or three or four languages. Maybe I can include some English mouthing, some ASL signs, for example. Um, but there's there's a real purpose there in, in thinking about the person's language experiences and proficiencies um, in the moment, who you're talking to, and that could form how you use um, you know, international sign language or a mixture of sign languages that you and the other participant know. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think that goes back to the question that uh, Gaurav has asked about um, international variants and the importance of that. You know, with any source that you have, you have a variety of structure and you have to consider the context and the situations that you're working in and there are so many layers. And then you might be doing that, but is the recipient of the conversation also doing that? Or is your international sign being used in a more expository form? And you're, in a sense, broadcasting information to an audience, but you don't know the audience, and so they therefore are unable to negotiate the language. If you're at an international conference, you assume that um, people in the audience would understand you, but certainly there would be people that you wouldn't be able to negotiate the language for. It's fascinating. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm trying to come at this from a different um, point of view, and this may be hard to answer. So there are dynamics of international sign language, and when you're using it, depending on the person, the context in which you're using it, and you had a wonderful, beautiful explanation of all of the context that could, be, you know, pos you could possibly find oneself in. But I'm wondering what is a successful sign language, international sign language interpreter? We know what um, we can call a successful interpreter between two different languages. What are the capacities of, of, of this phenomenon? I mean, if we are at an international conference, should the interpreters be required to arrive a couple days ahead of time to practice this use of language and the audience as well so that they are able to understand what's being presented? You know, I, I often wonder, international sign language is all well and good, but I'm just wondering, you know, I haven't experienced it that much. I've watched some of it, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that idea. Oh, um, I'm so fascinated by your questions. You've actually raised several questions, and I guess being a PhD student, a student, um, you know, just I naturally start thinking about these questions and you're talking about how do we make sure that our interpreters are conveying information appropriately as well as our audience members. Are they um, comprehending these languages, what we might call an auxiliary language um, in a conference? And I can't answer that fully, but I think that that what this does suggest is that we have a lot of need for research. And if you'd like to continue this research with me, uh, contact me. I'm happy to continue on with more research studies after this. Thank you. Again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I know that <laughs> you've hit upon a topic that obviously many of us are extremely curious about and so I do want to take an opportunity to thank you. Thank you Dr. Mather for joining us for our question and answer period. I would also think, like to thank a few other individuals the Gallaudet TV department for their wonderful services that they provided today. Our excellent interpreters who came to us from Gallaudet Interpreting Services and plus the GURAC for sponsoring this event as well as the Department of Interpretation here at Gallaudet for being the official host. Now before we close, I would like to tell you about our next event, November 6th. We have Dr. Christine Monikowski 
mentee ID who will present on her experiences as an academic looking back on her journey. That lecture will take place at 7 o'clock and please do contact me if you have any questions on how to access the live stream. We will also have a reception after that lecture series in November. So thank you mu very much and enjoy your day.